Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is unrecognized nuclear weapons states. And I want to start off by being very clear about what I mean by unrecognized in this context. You'll recall from last time that by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, only the United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France, and China are recognized nuclear weapons states, and thus they are permitted under this international law to have nuclear arsenals as long as they are working in good faith toward disarmament. As a result, remaining countries are unrecognized, at least insofar as the Non-Proliferation Treaty is concerned. But to be even clearer about this, the five countries that I'm going to be describing today are technically not in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Because to be in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, one has to be a party of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in the first place. And with one exception, these countries were never a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the fifth remaining country was once a member, but then decided to leave the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they were allowed to do by the terms of that treaty. Okay, so now that we've been a little bit more clear about what unrecognized means in this context, we can go forth and talk about which countries are the remaining five that possess nuclear weapons, or at least have possessed in the past. Let's get to it. In 1974, India became the first unrecognized state and sixth state overall to join the nuclear club. At the time, and even still today, India had rivalries with both China and Pakistan. And during a particularly intense moment in that security relationship, India started working toward developing nuclear weapons. Those efforts paid off in 1974 when India tested the Smiling Buddha device. Remember, India is not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and thus, under that treaty, they don't have an obligation not to develop nuclear weapons, because they are not a participant in it. Nevertheless, the Non-Proliferation Treaty has helped develop a norm against nuclear weapons, and we can see how that rubs off in the way that India describes its nuclear choices. When India announced the Smiling Buddha test, they described it as a peaceful nuclear explosion. To be clear, there are peaceful uses of nuclear weapons, at least in theory. A single nuclear blast moves a whole lot of dirt in a very short period of time. The problem with doing this, even if you have some sort of meaningful reason to want to move a lot of dirt in a short period of time, is that a nuclear explosion creates radiation. And so in practice, there aren't really very many good uses of peaceful nuclear weapons. And so we don't actually see peaceful uses of nuclear explosions happening in the world. So when India describes the Smiling Buddha as a peaceful nuclear explosion, Everyone knows what it really is, a message sent to China and Pakistan about India's nuclear military capabilities. Nevertheless, India's nuclear program remained mostly dormant for a full 24 years, until there was another flare-up in 1998. We'll talk more about that in a second. In 1978, Israel became the seventh member of the nuclear club. Like other countries we've seen so far, Israel's main motivation was an intense security environment. But Israel also had a vulnerability we have yet to encounter. Namely, Israel has a very small landmass. It is possible that in the event of an invasion, the entirety of Israel might be overtaken in a very short period of time. Having a nuclear deterrent might help with that. A country that is considering invading Israel needs to rethink its plans if it knows that Israel is going to respond with a nuclear retaliation. Israel's progress toward a bomb was rather slow moving. The process began with the development of the Dimona complex in 1956, which you see here. It took more than two decades to go from here all the way to the development of a functioning nuclear weapon. Unlike other countries we've seen so far, however, Israel did not go and announce this. In fact, even to this day, Israel has not publicly declared that it has a nuclear weapon. It has not acknowledged it. 
And in fact, whenever a politician even suggests that Israel might have nuclear weapons, this creates a political scandal in the country. Once again, we're seeing the effect of norms here. Israel does not want to come out as a nuclear weapons state because they think that this will cause normative backlash against the country. But despite the fact that Israel has not acknowledged the fact that it has a nuclear weapon, it is common knowledge that they do. No one doubts Israel's nuclear capacity. In 1979, South Africa became the eighth member of the nuclear club. South Africa is unique for a bunch of different reasons. To begin is the motivation for the bomb. South Africa was concerned about civil war spillover from Angola. There was a civil war going on in Angola, and members of the South African regime were concerned that fighting might start taking place in South Africa as well. Now, one would think that the development of a nuclear weapon for the purposes of influencing civil war spillover might be to actually use that weapon offensively. Not the case here. In fact, South Africa's plan was to secretly make a weapon and then after being successful in developing a nuclear weapon, specifically not to tell anyone about it, and then wait, and in the event of a civil war spillover, South Africa would announce it, and then not try to use it, but use the leverage of being able to possibly use it to convince the West to come in and provide conventional support. So the threat to possibly use nuclear weapons might lure the West to come in and intervene on behalf of South Africa. You have to remember at the time, South Africa was in the middle of apartheid. And so Western governments were not particularly keen on helping out South Africa. But perhaps the concerns about using a nuclear weapon offensively might convince those countries to come in. South Africa is also the subject of some intrigue in what is known as the Vela incident. This is the Vela Hotel. It's a U.S. spy satellite. In 1979, over the ocean between Africa and Antarctica, the Vela Hotel detected a flash. To this day, we still do not know what that flash was. However, every other time the Vela Hotel picked up on such a flash, a nuclear weapons test was responsible. And so the leading theory is that the Vela Hotel detected a nuclear test that was co-sponsored by South Africa and Israel. Although, again, we still don't actually know what happened on that date. Perhaps the most interesting facet of the South African program, however, is that they are the only country that has ever given up nuclear weapons. In fact, the nuclear weapons program was dismantled in 1989. Now, you might think to yourself, this is a very happy story about finally there is some hope in the world for nuclear disarmament. Here we have a country that has had nuclear weapons and then decided eventually, no, it is time for us to no longer have nuclear weapons. And then you find out that part of the motivation for this was that the apartheid government was coming apart at this time. And the apartheid government did not want the ANC to have nuclear weapons. So racist being racist, the white government decided that the black government should not have the nuclear weapons arsenal that South Africa had, and worked toward dismantling the program as a consequence. Pakistan became the ninth member of the nuclear club in 1998. At the time, the rivalry between India and Pakistan was heating up. You'll recall that India first tested weapons in 1974, and now 24 years later, tested a new series. Pakistan responded tit for tat. And as a consequence, India and Pakistan were jointly awarded the Ig Nobel Peace Prize, that's a satirical version of the Nobel Prize, for their aggressively peaceful explosions of atomic bombs. Nevertheless, there have been some serious consequences. India and Pakistan regularly fight militarized interstate disputes between them. And that's particularly scary when both of those countries have nuclear weapons. But there have been a couple of issues specific to Pakistan as well. First, many now describe Pakistan as too nuclear to fail. In other words, countries feel obligated to provide support to the Pakistani regime, regardless of who that regime is, and that has changed over time, because other countries need to be worried about what would happen if the Pakistani government were to fall, 
where would those nuclear weapons go? And the United States in particular has been sponsoring whoever the Pakistani regime is because of these concerns. Another issue that arose was the spawning of the AQ Khan network. AQ Khan was the father of the Pakistani program. And after he was done with his work on the Pakistani weapon, he created a black market for nuclear materials, where other countries began buying materials that AQ Khan was helping to design and develop for the right price. As a consequence of that, the non-proliferation regime has had to work especially hard to try to thwart the efforts of AQ Khan and these black market materials. North Korea is the 10th and most recent entrant in the nuclear club. It had a long running program over which time there were many efforts to reach an agreement. None of those ultimately worked out. Perhaps the closest was the agreed framework in 1994. Here, North Korea and a set of international partners led by the United States attempted to trade energy assistance for the nuclear program. The agreed framework failed to be implemented, however, and both sides blame each other. The United States was slow to provide the assistance that it wanted. President Clinton had signed the agreement, but Congress disagreed with it. And meanwhile, North Korea was very slow to actually make physical progress on dismantling its nuclear program. With those failures fresh in mind, North Korea withdrew from the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2003. In fact, doing that is very easy. To withdraw from the NPT, all you have to do is give three months notice. And within three years, North Korea started testing nuclear weapons. The test in 2006 was very small and may have fizzled. In other words, the nuclear reaction didn't fully work. But those tests became better and better in 2009 and 2013. And then there were some truly scary tests in 2016 and 2017 as well. I want to conclude with two thoughts. First is on the distribution of weapons. We now know the nine countries that have nuclear weapons, but it turns out that the distribution of weapons among those nine countries is not at all uniform. What you see right now is the current distribution of nuclear weapons, or at least our best guess of that. This is a bit of an inexact science, but there is one clear thing to take away from this graph. If you look at Russia and the United States, they are in order of magnitude above France, China, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, Israel, or North Korea. There are way more weapons in Russia and the United States than anywhere else in the world. And if there's any good news here, it's that in fact, despite the fact that Russia and the United States have way more weapons today than anyone else, they are still way down from their overall high during the Cold War. The other thing I want you to think about is the number of countries that have nuclear weapons versus expectations thereof. Yes, it might be bad that we have nine whole countries that have nuclear weapons, but put yourself in the shoes of John F. Kennedy. This is something that he said in his third presidential debate with Richard Nixon. There are indications that because of new inventions, that 10, 15, or 20 nations will have a nuclear capacity by 1964. It turns out that this was not founded. The 10th country that developed nuclear weapons was North Korea, and that didn't take place until after the turn of the millennium. And we don't have an 11th country, we don't have a 12th country, we don't have a 15th country, and we certainly don't have a 20th country. Why is that the case? Well, to go about starting to answer that question, it might help to think about countries that were considering nuclear weapons and ultimately decided not to build them. And we'll start that process in the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time. Take care.